the results for the all other response equations. Thank you. Um, and yeah, thanks for coming back um, for the afternoon session. Um, yeah, so today I'll be talking about two annual test results for um, two famous equations, two main equations in the fluid dynamics. One uh, for the earlier equations in the Lagrangian formation and one for the Navier Stokes equations in two different settings, but um, basically they are on altistic of solutions. So starting from the first one, right ahead. Um, <coughs> before we get to the analtisti, uh let me introduce a little bit about the earlier equations. So we, um, the incompressible homogeneous earlier equations um, can be written um, in this way, um, given by this system. And we consider this system um, in the whole space for dimensions <coughs> two and three. So the first one is the, uh, the momentum equation, the famous momentum equation uh, for fluids. And the second one is the divergence zero condition, the continuity of mass, uh, which could also give us the incompressibility of our fluid. And we combine this set of equations with the uh, initial condition at time t equals zero. So right now the system is written in terms of the Eulerian coordinates. And there is another way to express the system. Um, just instead of looking things at a fixed uh, point in space and time, xt, we can um, take reference to a Lagrangian formulation. And we could just uh, fix a fluid particle and consider the flow line of that fluid particle. In order to do that, we introduce this particle trajectory mapping, x alpha t. So x alpha t gives us the location of a particle at time t equals t, um, and which is initially placed at the point alpha. So by definition, uh, this mapping is given by this nonlinear ODE, where u is uh, the Eulerian velocity. And initially, again, by definition, when time t equals 0, our particle should be at point alpha. So initially, we have the identity mapping. OK. Um, so composing the Eulerian velocity and the pressure with this trajectory mapping, we get to the Lagrangian versions, V and Q. And then another thing that comes up in the Lagrangian setting is the inverse of the Jacobian of this mapping, the change of coordinates. We have this matrix, and I'm going to denote it with y. Um, and then using these new variables, v, y, and the pressure q, which could be written in terms of um, the velocity, we have this Lagrangian uh, formulation of the earlier equations. Again, a system of uh, d plus 1 equations. And we close the system with the initial conditions again. So at time t equals 0, we have our initial data, u0. And again, at time t equals 0, the matrix y is the identity matrix. One of the key identities in the Lagrangian formulation is the equation satisfied by the matrix y. And here, the same column is just it's the matrix um, multiplication. Another key identity that um, we really like to have is the vorticity equation. So when dimension d equals 2, we have this nice formula that says that the vorticity <coughs> omega, which is the curl of the velocity, is preserved along the <coughs> particle trajectories. And, um, and the vorticity stays constant in time. Um, in 3D, um, things are a little bit different, <coughs> just slightly. Vorticity, it's still, it is still carried along the flow. Uh, but the magnitude of the vorticity, it changes by this factor. Um, it can either get up or down the magnitude by this factor gradient of the trajectory mapping. Um, so if you write things in terms of the Lagrangian variables, we, um, this is an equivalent way of writing the Cauchy invariance formula, which gives us a nice vorticity equation in terms of, um, so we can express um, 
this equation by, it's, it's again given by the initial vorticity. And here we sum up in i, j, k, and l. And epsilon is the, um, it's the sign of the mapping that takes 1, 2, 3 to i, j, k. And so now let's get to the analysis of solutions. Uh, so for earlier equations, we know that if we start with an init uh, analytic <coughs> initial data, the solutions stay analytic both in two and three dimensions as long as the solutions exist. Um, so this has been proven a while ago. And one problem here is that um, although the solutions stay analytic, it may not stay in the same analytic class. What can go wrong? The radius of analytic may go down. So it makes sense to consider what happens to the radius of an altistic in time if we have persistence or not. And in order to answer that question, we do define this on altistic classes. So for, um, oops. So given um, our Sobola functions um, for the isotropic case, and and the same is true for the Gervais regularity as well. If you start with the Gervais regular initial data, solution stays Gervais regular. And the Gervais regularity, I'm going to be um, defining everything in terms of the Gervais regularity here. So um, given our functions f, we take the, um, for the isotropic case, we take the multi-index uh, derivative of f, the HR norm of our derivative, and then multiply it with this binomial coefficient, which is basically the radius delta to the power of the order of the derivative divided by a factorial term uh, with this power s. So if this power s is equal to 1, we have the basic analytic class. And for indices s greater than, strictly greater than 1, uh, this gives us a Gevre regularity class with index s and radius delta. It is, um, it's like considering almost analytic functions, they are still smooth, but fail to be analytic. And if they satisfy the bounds in terms of this factorial to the power s, we call them Gevre regular. And again, in the anisotropic case, uh, we just fix the direction and then take the uh, supremum of this uh, Taylor coefficients. OK. Um, so with this setting in mind, uh, my advisor and I, we proved that if we start with an initial data which belongs to a certain Sobolev class uh, with index r plus 1, where r is larger than d half, so that we have an algebra. And if we have the gradient of the initial data belonging to a certain Gevre class with index s and radius delta, then the unique Sobolev solution uh, it stays in the same Gevre class for a positive amount of time. So this gives us a persistence of the radius delta. And this type of persistence uh, results, it's been studied by uh, Konstantin, Kukovica, and Vikol earlier. And um, so there are different ways of um, setting our unaltistic classes, and, uh, and, their, and their result require the summability of Taylor coefficients. And another way to look at things is just um, putting a more natural supremum condition instead of summability. And this gives us a more flexibility in terms of computations as well. Um, OK, so the basic idea is to make use of the vorticity equation and the evolution equation for y. So we try to estimate uh, these two quantities, vm and zm, inductively. And so for the first one, we, since we are in the whole space, we switch things, switch the order of the derivative and the gradient and apply the Helmholtz decomposition and then the elliptic curl div system to have this nice uh, iteration for Vm. And for the latter one, for Ym, we use the Lagrangian evolution, basically. And, um, and that gives us the persistence of radius. Uh, the same thing is still valid for local solutions. Just by multiplying with a specific cutoff function, we still get the persistence of radius. Um, so the, having a cutoff function in the system, it gives us a 
condition or a restriction in terms of the Gevre index, we do have the slower bound, but we are safe as long as uh, the parameter of our sobol of space is away from d half, and we still uh, have the persistence of radius delta for for a short amount of time, or for positive amount of time. Um, one uh, important thing or interesting thing for me is that uh, this type of results, they may fail in the Eulerian setting. And um, so given our functional setting, one can actually construct um, an initial data u naught for the Eulerian coordinates, which is incompressible and belongs to a certain, belongs to a real and autistic class, not even very regular. And the solution of Euler equation with this initial data, it just it gets kicked out of the analytic class immediately for any positive time t. It doesn't belong to uh, the real analytic class anymore. Okay, um, so now I want to switch gears towards the Navier-Stokes system and uh, introduce another analytic problem. So the Navier-Stokes system is given by this. Uh, system of PDEs. Basically, we have this Lagrange um, Laplacian term given us as an extra term. And um, usually it's, it comes with a viscosity term, but here the viscosity is going to be fixed, so we could always scale it down to one and have our solution U be depending on the viscosity. So we look at the Navier Stokes system um, in the half space, again for dimensions two and three. And we consider the Dirichlet boundary value problem with uh, the initial um, data given as u naught. And this time we consider a space-time analyticity uh, result or we space-time analyticity norm. Um, since we are in a specific <coughs> domain and we know the geometry of the domain, we could um, make things a little bit more specialized and we have these three types of derivative operators this time. We have derivatives in time, and instead of the gradient as our space derivative, we could just look at the tangential and the normal components. Um, and this gives us three types of radii um, in time and normal in the tangential direction. And then multiplying everything with, um, with a factorial term, to the power s again for Gevre norm. And having this um, shift coefficient, um, we could define our Gevre norm in this way. And, and then having this norm defined, showing that the solution u is Gevre regular in space time, um, follows from establishing um, uniform upper bounds on this, on this norm phi for some positive time. And um, for that, um, one can try to look at the linear part of the system, the Stokes equation, and try to obtain uh, or establish an inequality of this type if we can put an inequality that depends on the um, norm of the initial data and a Gevre type norm of the body force F plus a linear combination of this sort uh, with t prefactors multiplied with phi to some positive powers, then using standard barrier type arguments, one can always deduce that um, the norm phi actually it can be state bounded or it can be controlled by this uh, constant that depends on the, oops, sorry. We can, we can have a control like this that with a constant that depends on the initial data and the Gevre norm of f. So here is our main result. Uh, again, for dimensions two and three, um, if we start with an incompressible initial data but, uh, with finite sobol f regularity, and if we, uh, if we require it to satisfy some compatibility conditions on the boundary, and if we have a real analytic uh, body force F, then the solution U of the Cauchy problem for Navier-Stokes satisfies the analyticity bounds that I just introduced in terms of the 
um, having an upper bound that depends on the initial data and the unaltested norm of f. So this gives us um, this gives us a Gevre regulator unaltested uh, result of u that goes uniformly up to the boundary, which doesn't really require the unaltested of the initial data, but we still need the body force f to be analytic in that respect. And I'm not going to go to the details of the proof. And I'm uh, over time. So, yeah, this is all. Thank you very much.